When it comes to your child's struggles in school, do you feel like you're constantly putting out fires? You do tutoring here, you use that accommodation there. You've tried a number of therapies, but your child still feels dumb and not getting more independent. If you're not addressing the real cause of the problem, you're spinning your wheels and losing precious time. Today, we're going to talk with clinical psychologist Elizabeth Geringer about how to evaluate the whole child in order to point parents in the right direction for treatment, and we'll talk about what real solutions look like. This is LD Expert Live. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, and founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. This book will help you understand why some bright children and teens struggle in school and what can be done to change that permanently. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Let's say hello to Lauren and all of you joining us live in the chat. Good morning, Good morning. Lauren. Good morning. Hello to everyone who is out there watching us live. Let us know that you're here with us live and where you're checking in from. Post your questions and comments for Jill or today's guests in the chat, and we'll get to those. And also, you know, when we're worried about our kids and trying to get answers, we always put a lot of focus on the challenges, what's not working. But each learner has a unique set of strengths and weaknesses. Both are important in finding the best path towards treatment and success. So we would love to hear from you. Post in the chat your child's unique strengths. We would love to hear about them. Go ahead and post that in the chat and we'll check back in a little bit. All right. Thank you, Lauren. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Our guest today is Dr. Elizabeth Geringer. Dr. Geringer is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in neurodevelopmental, neuropsychological, and independent educational evaluations for children, adolescents, and adults. She helps clients better understand how their brain works and provides a personal plan for clients to follow in order to thrive and live a happier, healthier life. I'm going to ask her more about that in just a minute, but let's welcome Dr. Geringer. Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to have you. Thank you for having me. So you have a practice in Camarillo and Westlake, California, right near our Thousand Oaks Center. In fact, I think our center is right in between your two offices. Yeah. We were so excited to meet you because your philosophy is completely in line with ours when it comes to understanding and finding solutions for struggling students. I would love for you to tell us about all the different kinds of testing you do and your goal for students and families who come to you. Okay. Well, let me just tell you about like three kind of general categories of testing that I do and a little bit about the differences and why that's important. So starting with the first one would be neuropsychological and that's really looking at cognitive functioning. So we're looking at memory, attention, ex executive functioning, visual processing versus verbal processing, and really looking at intelligence levels. And then we add in all the psychological factors that could be influencing any of those things. So we're looking at anxiety or compulsions or a little bit of lower self-esteem or things like that could that could show up and influence all of those things I just mentioned as well. The second category is going to be psychoeducational or those independent educational um, evaluations. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the difference is for that later. But basically what that is, is combining that cognitive functioning piece with psychological, but adding 
academics. So, okay, where is the child struggling to achieve? Is it in reading or writing or math or things like that? So the psychoeducational or independent educational evaluation that adds that academic piece. And then lastly, the third category is neurodevelopmental. And basically, it just adds one more component. This is more of the all-encompassing type of evaluation. And that adds in things that we would typically see problems that occur in the early developmental period. So things like autism or ADHD or intellectual disabilities. Um, also common speech or language um, disorders will present early and also getting into very specific learning disorders as well. So the neurodevelopmental just kind of goes through the entire individual, whereas the neuropsychological has just doing the cognitive and psychological, psychoeducational adds the academic piece, and neurodevelopmental adds the developmental on top of that. So those are kind of just the general three broad categories of testing that I do. So that is, that is really helpful. Now, if a parent were thinking that they, they know there's something going on, they want to get testing for their child, how do you kind of guide them which type of testing they need? Because I, I feel like that would be difficult for parents to know. For sure. So I often have parents call in and they're really unsure. Uh, they said, you know, the, the something is wrong. You know, some, my son is behind, um, he's acting out, and all of a sudden they're listing all these kinds of different symptoms. And so I usually just introduce them with the question of, tell me what's going on. And so I just listen to the parent and I jot down notes of like, what areas of those categories are they talking about? Is there attention problems? Are they, you know, struggling, don't want to go to school in the morning? Are they, you know, hating the learning process? Then I'm thinking, okay, is it really attention or is it anxiety? Or is it, do they feel unsafe because possibly there, you know, there could be some bullying or problems with social interaction? Mm -hmm. Um, there could be so many different things going on. So I really make it a point to just listen to what the parent is describing the problems are. And then I guide them because a lot of times parents will call in and just say, you know, um, my teacher said he, Johnny has an attention problem. So I need testing for ADHD. Well, to be honest, you can go to a pediatrician and they'll have you fill out a survey and decide he has ADHD and prescribe you medications. So that's not what we're looking at because there's so many different things that can affect mm -hmm. attention. So right. that's why I need to hear from the parent all the things that are going on both in the school and at home to really understand and point them in the right direction for what type of testing they actually need. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I love that because you're really looking, you're just looking at a much bigger picture than a diagnosis. And it's not that you don't want a diagnosis, you, you do, that's helpful, but, but I like that you're looking at a bigger picture. Right. And that's what the difference is between like um, a lot of parents will, you know, get testing done at the school, which is fine. You know, that's uh, a start. But to be honest, the school has a very narrow focus, right? Mm -hmm. They are looking at the child's behaviors or symptoms that are only affecting the academic process. Are they able to learn reading, writing, arithmetic? And so they're really only, that's the narrow focus, which is not a bad thing. That's all that they've been testing or trained in. However, there are so many other things that are affecting a child that could result in, you know, uh, slower reading development or something like that. Right, right. And, and actually, I want to talk about that a little bit more later. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about autism. You mentioned when we spoke earlier that there are many things that look like autism that aren't. What are some of those things and how do you tell the difference? Okay, so we typically, I see this all the time, you know, parents come in where they, you know, somebody might have said, okay, your child needs testing for autism. 
and they're really unsure. And so there are things that are very typical for autism. So immediately you think of communication problems. A lot of kids on the spectrum have speech delays. They didn't speak until maybe age three. So that's one of the obvious symptoms. The second is one that people don't know as much about, but they know that there's a problem with social reciprocity. And when I say that, I mean, can they build on your conversations? Do they, um, autistic kids typically have like one track mind. They focus on one thing that they're interested in and don't really pay attention to the conversation. They don't have that volley back and forth of social interactions. So there's that social component as well. And then the third area is repetitive behaviors. And I see parents unsure of this all the time as well, because you think of the typical autistic behaviors as like the hands shaking or um, the rocking motions, big motions like that. But repetitive behaviors include things like repeating verbal things, like um, if a child says the same thing over and over and has like a verbal ritual or likes to talk their way through or, you know, explain what's going on while they're doing things and no one's watching um, or have verbal or um, just physical rituals before bedtime or how they do something that you cannot break. Those are the repetitive behaviors. So those are the things that are core and central to autism. But there's other things. Okay, so the next option uh, that kind of looks like autism is social communication disorder. And the key item here that's lacking are those repetitive behaviors. So social communication mm -hmm. disorder has no repetitive behaviors. And it's very important to note that that's historical and current. Because if you're getting testing for autism a little bit later, say maybe you have an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old that's never been diagnosed, and you say, well, they're not doing any of those repetitive behaviors now. Well, did they ever? Because an autism diagnosis means that if they at one point did in the, like, their early preschool years, they would still be considered to have those repetitive behaviors. Often children learn to not do those repetitive behaviors. Parents tell them to stop or not do them. So, but if there was no repetitive behaviors ever, then it falls into a social communication disorder. Another option would be something like a nonverbal learning disorder. And often kids on the spectrum have additional problems with visual spatial processing and motor development. So we'll see problems with math and spatial relationships. We'll also see problems with coordination, balance, and fine motor. A lot of these kids with nonverbal learning disorder can't ride a bike, never learn how to ride, ride a bike, even into adulthood, have difficulty learning how to tie their shoelaces. They have like visual problems that are like poor memory of visual details. But they also have those social problems, difficulty understanding nonverbal communication, like gestures, body language, things like that. So you can be autistic and also have nonverbal learning disorder, but it not necessarily doesn't go the other way because you don't have those repetitive behaviors again. So it's a little bit different than social communication, but both are lacking those repetitive behaviors. And then the third option would be like social anxiety. And a lot of times people think when their kids have very high anxiety, don't want to socialize, don't want to interact with kids, that they might be on the spectrum. When in reality, if they're evaluating themselves constantly and feel like they'll be embarrassed and humiliated, that's anxiety. That's mm -hmm. not autism because autistic kids usually don't care. You know, if they're they're not feeling like they're being evaluated, they usually just go off on their own and play with bugs or whatever. They're not really understanding that social interaction as something that they're lacking. Whereas a child with social anxiety is very aware that they're mm -hmm. lacking that social interaction. So those are just like three other options of what autism could be could look like. That's really helpful. You know, once in a while, we get a student uh, who comes to us with a diagnosis of high functioning autism. And, and then when we test them, or we start working with them, we think, hmm, this looks more like dyslexia. 
-hmm. Both autism and dyslexia generally have some degree of auditory challenge. And when auditory uh, processing, when the auditory issue keeps the student from processing a full range of sound frequencies, they get an incomplete message. And so a dyslexic student might look lost or unengaged or like they don't comprehend, just as we see sometimes with our autistic students. Other dyslexic students experience a great deal of disorientation when looking at print. And, and that can create sensory overload and confused behaviors that someone might associate with autism, but the source of the challenge is different. And, and sometimes our dyslexic learners are so creative that they just tend to live in their imagination, which can look like a gifted child on the spectrum who's living in his own thoughts and areas of expertise. So understanding the root of the symptoms is really critical to creating the right cognitive learning plan. Absolutely. So where are some other places, Dr. Geringer, where you see overlapping symptoms or even misdiagnosis? Well, I love that you brought up the dyslexia and the creativity because there are so many things like that where you're seeing overlapping symptoms. And a lot of times I would say attentional difficulties are a big one. I think that for a big period of time, kids that were more active or distracted or had trouble sitting still were just automatically um, labeled as attention problems. Mm -hmm. But in reality, there can be so many other things that are affecting that. I mean, from psychological, where is there anxiety or depression or things going on that makes it so they have difficulty concentrating? Or is there something like a problem with learning? So they don't want to sit down or concentrate on something because it's too hard for them to learn. Mm -hmm. So is there something different like that that's causing that um, the behavioral reactivity to something that is a deeper concern. So I would say uh, attentional problems, I think we're just kind of all lumped together. When you say a child that was not concentrating or was more hyperactive, they just immediately labeled it as an attention problems when it really could be a really broad spectrum of something going on. Um, another thing I think I, I often see is the gifted individuals that get misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. A lot of times right. what happens with gifted, whether they're autism or not, is that they fly under the radar because people do not, you know, if you're meeting expectations at school and things like that, then they tend to leave you alone. Well, the problem is with that is that we have a lot of these kids that are highly intelligent that may be bored in school. They're not stimulated. So all of a sudden they're hyperactive or they're acting out or, and so now we're labeling a gifted child as ADHD or oppositional defiant in the classroom and things like that. And so a lot of those get misdiagnosed as well. And I would say the, the learning disabilities as well get often overlooked and misdiagnosed all the time because there's so many other things like auditory processing that you mentioned, you know, a lot of times when, you know, for us, there's so many other noises going on all the time that we can just, you know, tune out, you know, the lights, the air conditioning, you know, things going on outside. We just don't pay attention to them. We're able to tune in and focus to the important information. But a lot of times kids with specific type of learning disabilities, that auditory processing piece, and it can be visual as well, but specifically they cannot tune all those things out and focus in and learn. And it makes it for long-term learning very, to become very difficult for that individual. Absolutely. And of course, in a classroom, the first thing of teacher is probably going to see when a child is struggling is they're going to see a lack of attention or right. a reactive kind of behavior. Right. Um, and so it's easy to mistake that for, for an attention deficit when there are so many other things that it could actually be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you were mentioning 
uh, the really gifted kids, I mean, really, truly, so many of our students with learning challenges are really bright. I know. Um, and, and sometimes they go, a lot of times our kids, they start to show up about third grade as having difficulties. But sometimes kids get all the way to high school or college before their challenges catch up to them to the point that they just can't can't do it anymore. Um, and I, I think you see some of those kids, right? Yeah, I often have people come in that are high school or even college age where they have gone gotten by just fine. And usually these are children that have a lot of support. They have parents that are involved. They have, you know, parents that are working with them after school, checking in on their homework, getting them tutors, whatever they need. They have very supportive environment. And so they do well in the lower grades. But what happens is when you get to high school or college, it's, it, the gap becomes unbridgeable for the parents. So you start, you know, very young, it's just a small gap and it gets bigger and bigger. And with parent support, it's narrowing the gap, but still they get to a point where parents can't help anymore. There's too much or too difficult to bridge that gap. And what happens is you have um, students that break down they lose interest in their education, they give up, they feel like a failure, when in reality, they could be very bright and very capable, but they haven't learned the tools to, uh, to learn to really study because they haven't had to. And so we have a lot of things that, you know, self esteem, anxiety, um, feelings of hopelessness and failure that come out in high school and adulthood, because they haven't received any diagnosis to kind of get them in the right direction. And I would say that goes along in most cases for high functioning autism spectrum. Um, I have people that are getting diagnosed in their 20s or even later because they're intelligent. They have very supportive families, but then they reach adulthood and really cannot make that transition to adulthood. It becomes too difficult to socialize in it. In, in the college environment or work environment, live independently, um, make all those appointments, pay bills and things like that. So that transition is very hard. And you have a lot of young adults or, you know, in that older adolescent age that are, are failing. And then they really struggle to really understand who they are, how they mm-hmm. fit in, and how to be successful. And a lot of them just lose motivation to the point of giving up, which is really a shame because they have so much to offer Mm -hmm. and beginning of adulthood, but we just need to kind of give them an understanding of why this is happening and um, understand that they're okay and that get them on the right path and get them the sports to move forward. And maybe they just need a little extra time for on their exams in college. Maybe they have need um, some time with their supervisor at work to kind of understand maybe they need time to go to their desk alone and things like that. So there's just slight accommodations that can be made that can make a world of difference for these individuals. So I want to talk about this whole area of diagnosis a little bit because it, it sounds like, you know, even just helping a student like that, an older student who who doesn't get diagnosed until they're in high school or college, but then helping them to understand what what that really means in terms of how their brain works and and how they need to learn. You know, sometimes parents feel that a diagnosis will help them understand their child. And sometimes parents are afraid that a diagnosis will limit them. And I'm sure you run into both of those things as well. What are your thoughts around this? Yeah, I know I I understand from a parent myself. I have five of my own children. It's kind of scary to receive a diagnosis, whether it's psychological or medical or any of the above, right? To just say, okay, is this, you know, the the label that's gonna stand with them forever? However, diagnosis provides resources, it provides options, it provides understanding. I would say 100% of the time, 
when I work with even a child or a young adult or a parent, when I'm going through the feedback session and going over the accurate diagnosis, there's a sense of relief. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I understand this. This is my reason why. And parents always say, well, what do I tell Johnny who's eight years old? And I said, I guarantee he knows something's wrong. He mm -hmm. knows he's different and you got to give him, you know, according to the age, what's age appropriate, some understanding. You can go in there and say, hey, Johnny, guess what? We found out you're really good at this, but you're struggling in this area. So we're going to help get you um, some help in this area. And I guarantee you, they're going to be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I understand. It's a feeling of all of a sudden they have hope again. So I really do actually believe in diagnosis as really important. And I have like the young adults, a lot of them are coming to me because they do need that support within not only their family that they've had indirectly their whole life, but then in the community or in their work environment or in the classroom. And so all of a sudden they're getting just a few little accommodations that are making the world a difference. And that occurs because they have an accurate diagnosis. Now I am stressing the accurate diagnosis because <laughs> that's what's really important because your treatment plan is based on the unique individual. Everybody processes things differently. I mean, those of us who have multiple children know that from one child mm -hmm. to the next, they're completely different, right? And so when we're doing testing, we need to find out the unique ways that that child processes their world. And so then when you have an accurate diagnosis, I really do think it opens up so many options and understanding for the whole family. Absolutely. You know, I've had kids that have left our testing session. I mean, they haven't done any therapy or anything. And, and the parent will say, wow, it's, it's like he's starting to do better. And I think, you know, just sometimes there is a relief in knowing there's a reason why this is harder for me than, you know, the next guy. So, exactly. and, and I, I do think that a diagnosis can be important for getting your child support services and for gaining a better understanding of the thinking style. But I also would say that a diagnosis alone is not enough for us to create a targeted cognitive learning plan for the individual child, because functionally it looks different. Absolutely. Each person. Yep. So. And that's why um, basically what I do and what you do kind of go hand in hand, right? Because I'm giving, starting from a very broad view and to fine tuning it to very detailed. Like, is this child have difficulty putting things into long-term memory? Or do they have problems with retrieving things from memory? Is it auditory versus visual? Is it attention versus executive functioning? There's so many things. Mm -hmm. And then we fine tune it and you go in and design a very specific plan to help that individual with their symptoms, but even just their characteristics of learning mm -hmm. um, to better improve whatever they're struggling with. Right. And we are actually going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers. And today my guest is clinical psychologist, Dr. Elizabeth Geringer. We're talking about testing and understanding the whole child so that we can find real solutions instead of accommodations or a Band-Aid approach. We're going to look at what these kinds of solutions might look like after we check in with Lauren and our viewers. Yes, hello. So um, for parents that are answering the questions about their child's unique strengths, we have, let's see, Karen from Sacramento. She says, my child's unique strengths, he speaks in front of the class with ease. Hmm. Given his other limitations, it's great to see how comfortable he is with oral presentations and public speaking. That's amazing. That's a that great is. talent to have. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we have another mom, Wendy, in Mom Squad, saying that her son, who is on the spectrum, 
can make amazing structures. So he started with Legos. Mm. Um, he he does a lot of, of building that he can build almost anything. He's really good at visual projects like that. And let me talk about my child. So my daughter, uh, Cammie is five and she starts kindergarten next week and she has a math brain. And it's so funny because I don't. And, you know, and it's just funny how like that, you know, is what she gravitated towards. And so like, we'll, we'll be driving in the car and I'll just hear, mommy, is four plus five, nine? Like, <laughs> yes, yes it is. And then, and then now she's trying to wrap her head around multiplication, which again, like I didn't teach her any of this. And then she'll go, mommy, I know that two X four is eight. And I go two times four. Yes. <laughs> so it's just funny. Like our kids, they gravitate towards things and it's like, yeah, that's like, that unique kind of talent or strength. Um, so I, I just need to keep that going. Um, and, um, you know, keep her curious for kindergarten. So it's, it's just amazing to see. Um, we have some questions from parents, um, or actually Wayne is a grandparent. He has an eight year old grandson. Parents are divorcing this year. Teachers encourage ADHD testing. Unfortunately, health insurance does not provide. They're in the Sacramento area. Um, and he says he's willing to pay out of pocket for an assessment and a way forward. And so any advice for that situation? Yeah, I would say a couple things because um, first of all, if you can pay out of the pocket, I would definitely look for a neuropsychologist or a psychologist that specialize in child and adolescent testing, someone who has been really trained in that area. Um, but the other thing he can do is request a, an IEP, you know, and they can go to their school and say, you know, the teacher is noting attentional problems, but I feel like there's a lot more going on because if parents are divorcing, there's a lot of psychological issues that could be happening. Um, the school could start testing. I mean, this is a lot longer process, but if you disagree with their testing results or you want something further, that's when you have the right to request an independent educational evaluation. Now, again, this is you have to have reasons why and moving forward. And then um, a lot of times you can get the school district to pay for someone like me who does private evaluations. But it's a whole legal process and it takes a really long time. But yeah, someone who is saying there's attentional problems, but given just that fact that the parents are divorcing, I would say that there could be a lot of other things going on with this child. And I would highly recommend doing some outside testing. Makes sense. And then we have Amber, I, I believe she lives in the Tulsa area and it kind of leads to the question of, do you have any recommendations? We have a national audience. Um, and I know you practice in California. Do you have any recommendations for our parents who would like to get testing or services outside of California? Yeah, I would say um, the first thing I would do is just check your local networks, you know, and see, start with your pediatrician, you know, go to the pediatrician and say, some pediatric offices will have a psychologist on staff. And so you need to find out if they do. And if they have testing and it's the, you know, testing related to neurodevelopment mental. So I would start with pediatrician, but then you can do Google search online and you can literally just start typing in child neuropsychologist who does testing. Um, there's a lot of list serves like psychology today that lists um, different psychologists in areas all over the country. Um, and, you know, a lot of times people like I, I can reach out to my colleagues and say, is anyone in this area? And sometimes I can get referrals and recommendations. And believe it or not, I have people that fly in all the time and will mm -hmm. um, spend the night in a hotel and do all day testing in one day and then fly home. I had someone that flew in from Chile to get testing. Mm -hmm. And so there it's not unusual for people to to fly in and do testing. I have people that have come from out of state um, several times mm -hmm. and that will come in if that's something that they, they can do and have an opportunity to do that. But I would start, probably the easiest way is start with your pediatrician, start asking questions. That's great advice. Okay, parents keep posting your child's unique strengths as well as your questions or comments and we'll check back in in a little bit. Great, thank you, Lauren. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Geringer, mm -hmm. we talked about how important uh, it is to not only get an accurate diagnosis, but to get a picture of the whole child in order to put together the right treatment plan. And I want to dig into that a little bit more and take a look at what you see or would be looking for in testing and what the treatment that we do at Stowell Learning Center might look like. Okay. So <clears throat> let's take the case of a child who is behind in reading. What are some of the things that you would want to explore in order to find the reason behind the struggle? Okay, so I would say probably my first thing that I would do is I would look at their intellectual functioning. Is there a delay? Because a lot of times kids will come in and um, most kids are going to be in the average range of intellectual functioning. But I just had a, probably three or four months ago, um, a boy that came in and he was, I wanna say in the third or fourth grade, grade range, and he was coming in because he was struggling with reading. Well, I immediately did an, uh, an IQ test and found that he was in a very low intellectual functioning range and borderline um, intellectual functioning, which changed everything. So I need to look at intellectual for functioning first, make sure there's no delays. Um, then the next thing I need to look at is what type of reading is difficult for the child? Is it phonetics? Because if it's phonetics, there could be an auditory processing problem. And then we do auditory processing testing. Is it the sight words? If it's sight words, then there could be a problem with learning or memory or encoding that information into long-term memory, retrieving that information. So a lot different from phonetics to sight words. Or is it comprehension? Because then there could be problems with language development. So then we're, we're looking at very specific types of problems with reading. And then lastly, I would say very important is to get into the psychological piece. Is the child anxious at school? Is he constantly worried about wor um, reading in front of the group? Is he clamming up and feeling unsafe and just really stressed out at all times? So are there other psychological influences as well? So that's where I would start and kind of really tease out what the very specific problems are that are leading to what the school set sees as a delay in reading. There's a lot of underlying problems that would occur to cause that reading problem. You know, so often there is an auditory issue when a student struggles with reading. So a part of the solution in that case has to be to stimulate and improve the auditory processing so that the student's brain can then make sense out of phonics and reading instruction. And of course, if you're smart and you're not able to perform as well as you know you should, or you're feeling confused and disoriented when you look at the page, you're going to feel stressed and anxious. So the solution to a reading problem isn't as simple as just providing a good reading program. The anxiety, the visual disorientation, spatial confusion, auditory processing have to be addressed first in order for that good reading instruction to really take hold and work. Absolutely. It's very key is that because, like I said, the school is going to look at he's behind in reading a grade level or however they're going to count it, right? Mm -hmm. but they're not looking at the underlying problem. And again, I'm not saying these are not bad things about the school. It's just what their focus is, right? right. So uh, we're, like you said, we're putting a Band-Aid on the pro problem when you're getting services at the school, whereas in going to a center like yours, they're getting really at the underlying problem and working to improve those skills so that the reading naturally improves. And so it's a compound effect in all areas. Mm -hmm. So many parents come to us concerned about attention, which we talked about a little bit, and executive function. That's really a big, big concern coming up uh, these days. What would you want to explore for these kinds of challenges? Okay, so with attention and executive functioning, 
I'm first going to try to tease out the difference between auditory and visual attention. So I do tests for both. So one of the things that is in, inadequate is just by filling out parent surveys or, or teacher surveys and observing behaviors. What you really need to do is a computerized test that actually measures their auditory attention and another one separately to measures their visual attention and see how they compare on both and see if one is stronger than the other. And then again, there's always gonna be psychological factors or other intellectual differences and things like that, the way they're processing things. But really for attention and executive functioning, I'm always testing for both. And there's a whole bunch of tests that I can do for auditory um, executive functioning versus visual executive functioning. And one thing that I found when I do testing that way, I also have some tests that combine both auditory and visual. And that way I can see is if they have a de deficit in one area, when they combine the two, do they improve? And most often, those scores that combine both are somewhere in the middle. So if someone is better at auditory attention and executive function versus visual, when I combine the two, their scores will improve a little bit. And that helps really understand um, because if that doesn't occur, then we don't we can't use the strength to help the weakness. But most of the time, whichever area they're stronger in, when you combine the two, the child's going to perform better. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you talk about auditory executive function and visual executive function, just help us understand the difference a little bit. I mean, I realize auditory and visual, but but kind of what does that look like? So if you're looking at like auditory attention or executive functioning, can the child take in information that they receive auditorily? and manipulate it and be able to respond with that information? Can they hold it, categorize it, and spit back out more information? The same would be true visually. If they're given a whole bunch of things visually, are they able to look at, pick out the right information, and again, respond or select the right and answers? And how quickly can they find visual differences and things like that? Mm -hmm. So it's working with um, information and being able to manipulate it in short-term memory, working memory, so things that are happening very quickly, um, and being able to use that information effectively. Mm -hmm. and, and that whole idea of being able to manipulate the information is really important because that's that's how we kind of problem solve and... and exactly. Uh, you know, see different perspectives, being able to mentally manipulate the information. Well, and a lot of times what happens with kids that cannot do that is they lose the next step, right? They lose mm -hmm. where they are, they, of keeping track in, in an order or sequence of events that need to occur. So they are hearing the information, but if they can't manipulate and work with that information, then they don't know how to move forward, move to the next step and, and respond appropriately and um, make sense of that information. So we need to help them in that area so that they can, you know, maybe direct their attention to the right things and explore how to use this information to, um, to your benefit. Right, right. And, you know, again, just really, truly exploring and getting a big picture of all of the skills involved, the supporting skills involved is really important. I, I remember an 11th grade student who came to the learning center because he was failing and his mom was very concerned about his poor attention and his organization yeah. and executive function skills. He avoided his homework and, you know, whenever he would finally get started, he'd find all kinds of things to distract himself. Mm -hmm. And um, she was also concerned that he didn't really seem to have friends. Well, it turned out that Rich's attention was really solid on the IVA, which I think might be the test you were um, referring small. to, a continuous yeah. performance test right. that looks at different aspects of attention. But he had many areas of processing skills that were lagging, working memory, auditory processing, visualization, processing speed. And um, 
over the summer, he did a processing skills program with us, which doesn't look anything like academics or schoolwork, but it uses many different kinds of games and drills to improve memory and auditory and visual processing and attention and reasoning skills. And uh, it uses a metronome with many of the activities, which improves speed and regulation. And when he finished, all of his test scores, including reading and comprehension, improved. We had thought that we were going to need to do some specific work with higher level reading and comprehension. But really, once that base of solid processing skills was there to support him, his reading and comprehension came right up with it. So, um, <clears throat> and the other thing his mom noticed was that he seemed more mature. And, and we do see that often, you know, when kids are able to take in and think about information quickly and accurately, they respond better in the world. So Rich's mom called me at the end of the next semester and said that he had made friends, held down a job, and was achieving A's and B's. So here we had this really smart, motivated student who actually had good attention and executive function abilities, but his lagging processing skills were getting in his way of execution. That's really amazing because those are those are real live examples of exactly what I'm talking about, how testing goes hand in hand to moving the child to the next step, to getting the skills, the underlying skills that are really going to improve all areas of functioning. So mm -hmm. not just like you said, not just improving the reading or not just improving the organizational skills. All of a sudden, because we got at the root cause um, we're able to see the child really thrive in all areas. Right, right. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll, founder of Stoll Learning Centers, and my guest today is clinical psychologist, Dr. Elizabeth Geringer. Let's do one more check-in with Lauren and our live viewers. Hello, yes. So um, we have some questions again from parents regards to testing. Uh, Veronica is asking, once a child is diagnosed with a pediatrician, what's the next step? Okay, so getting a diagnosis, I guess it's really gonna under, like see what the diagnosis is. Pediatricians are gonna be kind of limited in what they can diagnose, right? So I assume with a pediatrician, it would be something like ADHD, or they might say, well, it looks like they have anxiety, but they wouldn't give any other real formal diagnosis. They would probably refer out. Um, but then the next step should be involved in the whole diagnostic process. And this is what I'm a huge stickler about is you should have recommendations and referrals immediately for services. And I'm not just talking about in school. I mean, there could be speech therapy. There could be occupational therapy, physical therapy. There could be educational therapists. There could be Stoll Learning Center. There could be um, all kinds of different referrals and recommendations. And when I do reports, I have sections and there is a section just for the parent of what they can do in their house and like mm -hmm. with an ADHD uh, diagnosis I always say screen time is balanced with green time okay so mm -hmm. I always tell the parents if your child is getting two hours of video games they are spending two hours outside in your backyard mm -hmm. and parents are going what I can't that's too much and I said it has to be because ADHD brain is very different. It needs that mm -hmm. outdoor stimulation. So that would be just one example of a parent recommendation. So parents mm -hmm. can do a lot of things. If their child is on the spectrum, they can get them involved in some social skills groups. And so we could do group therapy or even just finding an interest. You know, um, maybe your child is really interested in robotics or chess or music. Find a club in your area and get them there. Even if you are working with them every week and holding their hand and walking them in there, um, that's going to develop their social skills. So there's a lot of recommendations and referrals that will be for the parent home environment, school environment, and then therapeutic type of in interventions, which could include therapy, 
um, group therapy, uh, or and or medications. So there's gonna you're gonna cover uh, cover all areas. That would be the next step. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, and then kind of piggybacking off of uh, Jill's story a little bit, um, Lisa is asking, we had my daughter tested just before the pandemic by a pediatric neuropsychologist. We were told she is a slow processor. Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and um, certainly, you know, I would want to look at the at the bigger picture to see um, what else is around that. Um, But um, certainly the processing speed response time issue is something, something that we look at. We look at it both with, with training, you know, in terms of our, our processing skills work has a lot of work with, with, the metronome and timing, um, as well as our, our core learning skills. Sometimes the, the challenges, you know, are really going down into a much lower level of, of reflexes and motor skills. And, and so we work with rhythm and timing there to work on processing speed, sometimes response time, slow processing, um, could also be connected with diet, which is not my area of expertise, but, but I have a colleague who did a lot of research there with, with dairy and sugar and, and the impact on processing uh, speed and, and in particular response time. So, so there's a lot to explore there um, to see where that's coming from in order to, to make the right recommendations. And I would also add that like processing, slower processing speed is not unusual. It's, it's very common for kids to be better at verbal comprehension or visual spatial relationships, and then all of a sudden have slower processing speed. So there's things that you can do to speed up that processing speed, but maybe it just means that your child needs a little bit more time to process things, but there's lots of games and things like that you can do that have timers. And like you were talking about the metronome to kind of quicken that speed that with practice will improve processing speed. However, a lot of those type of things are pretty much stay the same. We can get improvement in the, like the general functioning, but if it's lower than other areas, that's not a severe problem. You're just saying that, okay, I need a little bit more time to figure this out. So we can work on speeding things up in the processing, but it just means that, you know, maybe their higher, more complex cognitive areas are stronger, which is great. Absolutely. Um, we have oh, a past guest, Alexandra Dennison, who's been on our show in the past. She's a cognitive consultant. She kind of provides a testimonial. I have a client working with you whose parents have noticed great improvement with higher cognition in their developmentally delayed daughter, like the boy you mentioned, Rich, who benefited. So um, yes, that like, you know, when you really work on those underlying skills, some areas that we don't even you know, address kind of, you know, across the board improve. Um, And so that was a great testimonial from her, from her client. Uh, Thank you for that, Alexandra. Um, If parents, if you have any other questions or you're thinking about testing or you kind of want to get advice from other parents who get it, we also have a private Facebook group, Mom Squad. You're welcome to join. Uh, You can find the link on our Facebook page or by searching Facebook groups, search the keywords SLC Mom Squad to request to join. That's just a community of parents who have kids or teens with learning and attention challenges. And we uh, post resources. I post a lot of guides in the guide section related to different um, underlying skills like auditory processing, dyslexia, um, attention challenges. So I post a lot of content and resources there, as well as parents who are looking to get advice from other parents. Uh, so you're welcome to join that. And another resource we have is our monthly peace group. That is our parent support group. Uh, we meet each month and we share resources and tools, strategies, things like that uh, for parents in working with your kid and helping to support your child. Um, this next month on September 23rd, 
Um, our meeting is on executive function. It's actually going to be a workshop style where uh, there's going to be a lot of parent interaction, uh, really working with your real problems uh, that you're facing with your child in regards to executive function. Now that the school year has started, let me tell you, our phone has been ringing off the hook <laughs> now that the school year has started because of executive function struggles. So that would be a great workshop for you to attend. You do need to register in order to join the Zoom meeting. You can go to stollcenter.com slash peace to get that registration link. And I look forward to meeting you and kind of working through all these things that we've been hearing from a lot of parents um, just about the, the return to school and the struggles and kind of being distance learning for a year and now having to use those executive function skills again. So looking forward to that. All right. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, so Dr. Geringer, Speaking of back to school, you were just mentioning just before we got on that that you're finding you're doing a, a lot more counseling with children, adolescents with going back to school. Is there anything that you would kind of want parents to be aware of or just what's happening with with that? Yeah. So what has kind of happened with the pandemic and parents being having their children at home doing home learning and zoom and for a long period of time what we've seen is like the natural progression of social development has kind of stagnated right a lot of kids have not been able to have that um, reciprocal information feedback right that they get from interacting with peers on a regular basis in school on the playground in sports and all those things where it's they're constantly checking their behaviors and the way they interact with people whether they know it or not because they're receiving feedback of what's appropriate and what's not and so you have a lot of children that have not continued to develop these skills because they just weren't exposed to it right so now they're getting back in the in the schools and they're interacting they're having a hard time sitting again for long periods of times learning in person and interacting instead of the independent learning having a parent help and the social part of it is becoming overwhelming i have a lot of kids that are coming in with problems with um, social anxieties um, self-esteem, comparing themselves to other people that I didn't see just a couple years ago. And it's getting younger and younger. I'm seeing kids in first grade that are coming in for therapy that um, I wouldn't have seen before this pandemic. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you're there as a resource for them. And I just think it's something we need to be aware of so that, sure. so that we you know, spend time just hanging with our kids and listening about their day and providing feedback. An interesting time we live in. Yep. So uh, if parents are looking for neuropsychological or psychoeducational assessment in their area, uh, and they're not, you know, in, in our area here, I know we touched on this a little bit, but what kinds of questions should they be asking to find someone like you? So they need to ask what type of testing is being done, okay, and what they're going to receive from the testing. So that's where I was, you know, mentioned they need to have a comprehensive report that is included with the testing that is going to cover all areas of testing, list the tests that were provided, and then provide options roadmap for interventions. So I'm talking about referrals and recommendations in all areas. So they need to ask what type of training the psychologist has, what type of testing is going to be done, what the they are looking for, and what they're going to receive at the end of testing. And then you mentioned uh, to, to specifically look for someone who has a specialization or, or a lot of experience with testing children or, uh, adolescents, if they very, have that age, yes, right? very specifically, because that's not common. I mean, most people who are doing testing out there do not have extensive, like once I finished my doctorate, I did a year internship and three years of a fellowship 
very specific to child and adolescent testing. So there, um, it's not common to find someone that has very specific training in these type of neurodevelopmental tests. Hmm. So that's very important. Yes, hmm. for sure. Great. Well, thank you for that insight. What last thoughts do you have for us today? I would say that I would stress that every child is unique. Everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. And testing is really going to get at the underlying problems with the child, but it's also going to reveal all the great things. I love asking parents, what are the best things about this child? Because a lot of times we can use those strengths to really buoy the child up, get them moving forward and progressing again. So uh, accurate testing and diagnosing is really going to understand the whole child, the unique way they perceive their world. And that's when you'll be able to really start moving forward with accurate interventions and treatments. Great. Well, Dr. Geringer, thank you for being with us today and for the work that you're doing for kids and families. I love your focus on the whole child and the time that you take to give families clarity and a sense of direction. It's really Thank helpful. you. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been great. Here is Dr. Geringer's contact information. She is a fantastic resource for you if you are in Southern California and a good model of who you should be looking for in your area. Uh, if you're searching out a diagnosis or a better understanding of your child's strengths and needs. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Next Tuesday, we will be talking about dysgraphia. This is a topic that was requested by a number of viewers, and we're going to have some fun with it. We'll explore why it's so hard to get words from head to paper. You'll get to experience what it feels like to have dysgraphia, and we'll talk about some tools that you can use right away to help your child. Be sure to join us next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Stowell Learning Centers are open for both remote and on-site sessions and evaluations. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to permanently eliminate struggles with dyslexia, auditory processing, attention, executive function, and learning differences so that the student can become the independent learner that they have the potential to be and, and thrive in school. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Dr. Geringer. If you're finding these broadcasts helpful, everyone, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out and hit that share button to help out other parents. We'll see you next week to talk about dysgraphia.